Good evening all. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode 334, the ninth in the oculoplasty module. Today we have with us the very learned Dr. Usha Kim from Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai to speak to us on management of congenital ptosis. Dr. Usha Kim, to give a brief introduction of this stalwart in the field of oculoplasty, we have her today on this platform. She received a fellowship training under Dr. William B. Stewart from University of California in the United States. She currently heads the Department of Orbit Oculoplasty, Ocular Oncology and Ocular Prosthetics at Arvind Eye Hospital. She also is a high volume cataract surgeon and now actively involved in genetic research and retinoblastoma. Under her leadership, the department has grown to become the largest unit of orbit and oculoplastic work in the world. She set up the Ring of Hope to raise funds for the eye cancer treatment. She has numerous publications, 61 to name a few, and 36 international, 25 and national and state journals. She is author of many book chapters, co-author of the Atlas of Imaging, a Neuro-Ophthalmology in Orbit. She was, has been the past president of Oculoplasty Association of India. She has numerous awards and accolades to her credit from the international and national bodies, Rotary Club and the Lions Club. It's a pleasure to have ma'am today. And I hope this session is going to be an eye-opener for many, many of us. Thank you for that lovely introduction. That was very kind of you. Now, let me share my screen. And uh, thanks again for the wonderful opportunity that has been given to me. Uh, Yeah. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I so much enjoy doing this. So the topic that has been given to me today is management of congenital ptosis. And as you all know, congenital ptosis results from a developmental dystrophy of the levator muscle. It could be just a simple, uncomplicated ptosis. Or you can have ptosis with superior rectus weakness. You could have syndromes like blepharophimosis syndrome, a synkinetic ptosis, which could be in the form of a Marcus Gunn syndrome, or a misdirected third nerve. We'll see each one of these as we move on. So a simple ptosis is where you have a straightforward simple ptosis without any other associated weakness of the other uh, muscles. So here you have a unilateral simple ptosis and here you have a bilateral simple ptosis. A simple photograph is not going to elicit all the movement disorders, but trust me, these two children have no other associated weakness. So it's a straightforward simple ptosis, which could be unilateral, bilateral, and it need not necessarily be symmetrical if it's bilateral. So all these are very important as we move on to manage the case. So let's look at this particular scenario where there is a ptosis, but there is an elevation deficiency here. So it is associated with superior rectus weakness. It is important for us to note all of these because the management is going to be completely different if it's going to be associated with a superior rectus weakness. Now, coming to the next scenario where you have a blepharophimosis syndrome, where you have a horizontal and vertical shortening of the palpebral fissure, which results in ptosis. And this could actually be present bilaterally. You have telecanthus, epicanthus inverses, and then a ptosis associated. So this can run in families. Here, a father and the son are having the same scenario. Now, next scenario is the Marcus Gunn phenomenon. So you all know there could be a jaw winking phenomenon where the person, when on opening the jaw or the mouth, can have a correction of the ptosis as in this particular scenario. So here she presents with ptosis, but on opening her mouth, she the ptosis gets cleared. So there is a flutter of the upper lid which is as a result of the, the connection between the trigeminal and the oculomotor nerve. So this could result in having a flutter of the upper lid. This is important because this could be a stigma for the patient. 
But in these patients, it's usually unilateral, can be rarely bilateral. I'll show you the examples in a little while. Now, what happens is sometimes it's not directly elicited like in this particular case. Here, the ptosis is present on opening, the ptosis gets corrected. Sometimes you have to do a sideways movement of the jaw as well. So when you're examining the patient, you also must ask the patient to open and close the mouth and move the jaw sideways. So th these two are very, very important for us to elicit a jaw winking phenomenon. Now, you could also have a congenital third nerve palsy as in this particular child. Here, the child has got a, a third nerve palsy and I, I'll show you the surgical correction for this particular patient in a while. So what are the surgical options? So the, today's topic is on management of a congenital dosis. So let's look at what the surgical options are and what is it based on? The surgical options are based on the amount of dosis, the amount of levator action and the associated comorbidities, which I've actually shown you. So for a congenital ptosis with the poor levator action, the only choice that we have is the frontalis muscle suspension. Now, what are the different modifications that we have? So what are the different modifications that we have while performing a frontalis sleep? You have the double triangle, as you see in this particular case, you have the double rhomboid, you have a single rhomboid or the pentagon, which is the Fox pentagon. So all these procedures, all these modifications have been tried and what works well for each of them is what has been chosen. But let's look at what the materials are that have been used in the past. The best ever known is the autologous facial latter. Your own is the best. So facial latter has been the gold standard. Preserved facial latter has also been tried. There are some non-absorbable suture materials which have been tried and muslin mesh as well. Now, what are the disadvantages of sutures? You have a scenario like this. Tissue rejection and infection. You see granulomas which were quite rampant in the past when we started using ethibon suture. Nylon slip, the knots slip very easily. So not very well uh, taken in the past. Proline, Gotex were all other suture materials which have been used and are continued to be used even today when you don't get access to the materials which I'm going to describe in a while. Now, what is the objection that we have to facial latter? It's the best ever known, but still there is an additional need for a surgery in the thigh, which most parents may not accept. And a scar in the thigh region, in our part of the world, it's not a big issue, but in the Western population, it seems to be a big matter of concern. Hematoma formation on the site, keloid formation, and herniation of the muscle belly. This has been published by Dr. Grover. So what is the alternative that we have currently? Silicon material. So let's look at what are the advantages. Small skin incisions are adequate and it takes a less surgical time. Though surgical time is not very, very important, it also adds value to the procedure. It can be performed in all eyes with doses with poor levator function and has greater elasticity. This is very important for us when compared to facial latter. So the closure becomes a far more easier and can be easily adjusted in under corrections or over corrections of the doses. And what's very important is it is easily available at the moment. So let's look at what are the contraindications for frontal sling. When you have a poor Bell's phenomenon, that is, as I showed you earlier, if the elevation is inadequate, then we should not advocate a frontalis sling. In case you're forced to advocate a frontalis sling, then what you need to do is just correct it adequately enough to allow the pupil to be visible. That is, 
just above the pupil or at the pupillary margin, you can have the lid seated. When there is a reduced corneal sensitivity, again, a big no-no to the frontal skin. When there is poor tear production, it can end up having an exposure keratopathy when you have all these things present. So let's look at the procedure per se. Now I'd like you to watch the incisions first. So I'm, I'm marking all the sides. I'll be talking to you about it in a while. So if you look at the incision locations, first we mark two reference points, one corresponding to the medial canthus, one corresponding to the lateral canthus. Then you have a central point which corresponds to the pupillary plane. That will be your point just corresponding to the visual axis. Now, what you need to do is take about a centimeter above the central point and that will be the summit of your pentagon. Mark a point on either side of the central point, which will be on either side. And then you, so now you have three points, one, two, and three. This will be above the brow. Never make any incisions on the brow. Now you have two more incision locations, which are corresponding to three and nine o'clock limbus, just about two millimeter above the lid margin. So you have one, two, three, four, and five. So these are the incision locations. Now let's move on to the procedure. Once the incisions are made, you have to enter through the summit of the pentagon with the silicon material, which is threaded to the needle, which goes in through each of these incision sites. And then it is brought out through each of these incisions. And to the summit of the pentagon, which is located corresponding to the visual axis. Now, once this is done, the next step for us is to thread it into the sleeve very carefully without piercing the edges of the sleeve. And then it's titrated here. The height is you have to position the lid on the superior limbus, which means it's just at the superior limbus, anticipating a one millimeter drop eventually, which is which corresponds to the normal uh, lid position. So we are positioning on the table at the superior limbus. Now, the next important step for us is to bury the sleeve. And here you make a very good superior tunnel and bury it. And then you apply the frost suture because this entire procedure is done in a child under general anesthesia. This frost suture can be removed the subsequent day. So these are some of the pre and post pictures. So unilateral ptosis, almost a complete ptosis where you get a very good correction and it corresponds, if you can see the other eye, it really matches very well. Now, this is another scenario. You have a unilateral ptosis. This is the post-operative picture. Again, you have a unilateral ptosis, post-op picture, unilateral and a post-op picture. If you see in all of these cases, you'll have very little scar. This is immediate post-op. But you can see that it almost disappears or blanches subsequently. Now, this is a bilateral ptosis. Now, let's move on to the next scenario. This is with the comorbidity. You have a blepharophimosis syndrome where you have the epicanthal fold. So, here what happens is there is a shortening of the horizontal aperture. So you have this epicanthal fold, 
which you can do a VY plasty. That is, you make an incision in the shape of a Y and then you convert it into a V. And then what you need to do is, you need to do a lateral canthoplasty as well, which means you're widening the horizontal aperture. Now, once that is taken care of, you need to correct the vertical shortening, which is by doing a frontalis link, which is very similar to what I showed you earlier. And to correct the telecanthus, you can do a transnasal wire. These are the three important procedures that needs to be done. Now, these are some of the post-operative pictures. You can see that there is a very decent amount of correction. And this is one uh, post-op. This is another child. And this is the post-op picture. This is immediate post-op. So you can see almost hardly any uh, palpable fissure, but we can give a considerable correction for both these children. Now let's look at the next scenario. The Marcus gun jaw winking phenomenon is usually unilateral. If you watch this young boy carefully, you see that as he's moving the jaw sideways, you have this flicker of the upper lip. As he's moving it sideways, he's not opening and closing, he's moving it sideways. Now look at this scenario where this child is having a flutter in both the eyes. Just watch him carefully. When he's moving sideways, he's got a flutter in one eye. And when he's opening and closing, he's got a flutter in it. So God has many ways to create a very good face and to also distort a very good face. So you can see both present in one single child. Now let's see how we correct this. So here the idea is we need to correct the flutter, which means you have to knock off the levator palpebrae superior. That is, you have to just excise the upper neurosis because if you just disinsert, what happens is it reattaches. So what you need to do is disinsert the levator upper neurosis from the tarsal plate and excise the upper neurosis completely and then subsequently do a frontalis link. Once we excise the upper neurosis, then you will end up having a gross ptosis. And then once the ptosis is present, you'll have to correct it using the frontalis link, which I showed you earlier also. And the same procedure is repeated in this young man. And this is also done with the silicon material. Just one suture is more than adequate. You can even use a glue if you... require. And then we do the frost suture and you can open up the frost suture the next day. So let's look at how he's performed after the, this was as I showed you earlier, he had the jaw wake, the flutter is there. Now after the procedure is done, just let, let's look at how he looks. So the flutter is hardly visible. So is, now the question is, is it important that we address all the jaw winking phenomenon? Not really necessary. If the flutter is bothering the patient, if it's causing a stigma for him, maybe we can consider. If the flutter is very minimal, we can again ignore. We can counsel the patient and let them know that this is not going to be a trouble for the patient. And remember, usually the Marcus Gunn jaw winking phenomenon will not cause any amblyopia because the patients tend to actually correct it themselves. They either position their jaw in such a way that the lid, the, uh, lid doesn't have the ptosis. Most of the time, these children do not end up having an amblyopia. So that's very important for us. So patients might wonder and ask you, is it necessary for us to correct it immediately? It's not necessary. 
is it actually absolutely essential that we have to correct this jaw winking no it's not absolutely essential unless it's bothering the patient and if the flutter is too much you can disinsert if the flutter is not too much you can even probably do a levator resection now Having said all this, let's also look at what the disadvantages of sling are. You will have a lid lag on down gaze and it's more pronounced in unilateral cases. So you're in a unilateral case, you're not going to do a bilateral surgery. Again, that's a subject of debate. We are not going to get into it at this point of time. So in unilateral cases, if you're going to do a sling in that particular eye, then you will have a a lid lag on down gaze, which has to be counseled to the parents prior to surgery. So you will have to educate the child not to bend his head down instead, I mean, not to look down on down gaze, instead bend his head so that the lag is not very obvious. The other thing is during sleep, the child is going to have a lag of thalamus, which could be very scary initially. So you'll have to educate the parents again. There could be a bit of a furrowing of the brow, which actually eventually disappears. Again, some surgeons, even for unilateral cases, would prefer to do a bilateral levator, I mean bilateral sling procedure. But again, this is only to obtain symmetry. And it's again a subject of argument. Not all of us advocate a bilateral surgery. It's left to the surgeon and the patient's parents. In my case, if it was my child, I would not do a bilateral surgery. I would rather address the problem and do away with that particular eye. But again, it's left to the surgeon and the patient again. Now, what are the complications? Do we not have any complications at all with frontal wrestling? No, we do have undercorrections overcorrections, as in any procedure, you could have suture granulomas. Even with the frontal sling, you can have granulomas. You could have, because of an overcorrection or, and because of lag of thalamus, there could be an exposure keratitis. There could be ectropion, notching, and all of these are correctable. Now, the next procedure is, if there is very minimal doses, you can do something called the Fasinella Servat surgery, where you do a tarso conjunctival resection. Now, I do not advocate this procedure in, uh, because it, in a very mild doses, when your levator is excellent, the expectation of the patients is also way too much. So I, it doesn't work very well in all my cases where there is no other pathology. But where it works very well is in this particular scenario where there is a bit of a neurofibromatosis as you can see in this particular scenario. So what I tend to do is do a bit of tarsoconjunctival resection and this is what you get as a result. So in specific cases, I do advocate this procedure. That apart, I do not advocate this procedure. But that does not mean that it is not a good procedure. It works very well in very good hands where you have a very good levator action. That is almost an excellent levator action. With minimal doses, it works very well. Now let's look at third nerve palsy. Here, often we end up having a squint. So you need to correct the squint first and then go for the frontal sling procedure or a levator resection. And remember, in this particular scenario, an undercorrection is what you need to do. That is, you have to clear the pupillary area. Now, let's watch this procedure. Here, I've shown you a different procedure where we do a levator resection. You make an incision. So, the, lip, the incision should be placed at about 10 millimeters from the lid margin in a female child and about 8 millimeters in a male child. And what you're seeing is I'm disinserting the levator from the uh, 
attachment to the tarsal plate. That's the levator. I'm dissecting it posteriorly. Please remember, posterior to the upper neurosis is the conjunctiva. So you have to be very, very careful. That's the pre aponeurotic pad of fat, which you see. So that's the levator, upper neurosis. And then you can, actually the algorithm for correction is for every millimeter of dosis, three millimeters of levator has to be resected. So here I have measured the amount of dosis and I know the amount of correction I require because it's a third nerve palsy. I just want an adequate correction to clear the visual axis. So I've measured and I have placed three sutures to reattach the levator upper neurosis to the tarsal plate using a 60Y3. And the excess levator upper neurosis is excised. Now to create the lid crease, you have to pass the suture through the skin orbicularis cut the end of the upper neurosis and again include the orbicularis and the skin. Now this is the correction that we get on the table and this is the pre-op picture and this is the post-op. It's not extremely satisfying because it's not matching to the other eye but then you can see that the visual axis is clear which is what we aimed at achieving post-operatively. Now, we also have scenarios where a neurofibroma can present. Now, what do we do with neurofibromas in general? We do not advocate immediate correction as a child is brought to you. You just look for clearance of the visual axis because this is going to be a recurrent condition. So, you see if the visual axis is clear, wait for it to grow. In a scenario like this, it is actually not allowing the visual axis to be cleared. So even the child is trying to open, but look at the size of the neurofibroma. So what I did here was I just debulked the uh, neurofibroma and you have to excise the uh, neurofibromatous tissue and you need to attach the levator and this is the correction you can get. In some cases, you may have end up doing a frontalis sling as well because you might lose a levator and it's a very bloody surgery. So you ha may have to reserve some blood in cases of huge neurofibromas. Now with all the small incisional surgeries, we also have a procedure where we can do away with just one single uh, incision. This is a, a lady who's had a uh, ptosis and a congenital ptosis. So I decided to do a single uh, incision surgery. So I went transconjunctivally. That is, I almost double evert and pass the same silicon material through the, uh, you know, I come out through the conjunctiva. So there is no exposure of this, uh, such, uh, the silicon material because my incision, I mean, what I pass through the same site, I come out and only with one incision, I'm able to achieve the uh, correction in this particular uh, patient. Now, what is the advantage of this over the other uh, procedure is, I'm able to get a good lid crease, which is not possible with the other procedure. Do I advocate in all the cases? Not really. This is a post-op picture. It's only when you want a minimal correction, when there is a, yeah. So when you have, you require a minimal correction and uh, if you need a lid crease, then that's the best method. We haven't done too many cases yet. So uh, we haven't published this. So this is yet another procedure, which I wanted to show. Now, what if nothing works? then I think we have an alternative, which is non-surgical, where you can 
use lid props. These can be tried as a temporary measure or you can even educate the parents prior to doing a permanent surgical procedure. So that's all I have about the management of congenital ptosis. And I'm open for any questions now. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, that was like a very crisp and uh, uh, yet an elaborate lecture because you covered everything that we had to know about the management of the congenital ptosis. Um, Ritika, any words from you? Hi, ma'am. Thank you so much for such a concise and, uh, you know, to the point lecture. Um, ma'am, I just wanted to ask you about that single incision surgery that you just showed us. Uh, so when you pass the suture through the conjunctiva, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not the suture, the, the sling material, that is going through the tarsals since ah, we are so, everting the lid at the upper border of yeah, the tarsal. So I'll explain that. I, I use my hand, okay? So this is going to be the tarsal plate. So I'm actually coming from behind. See, what is opposing the uh, globe is this portion. Hmm. Okay? But actually I need the suture material here. Hmm. So when I am everting, I'm actually doubly verting. Mm. I'm flipping the lid and I'm use, raising this a little more. So I push the needle in such a way that the upper portion of the tarsal plate is being addressed. Okay, when we flip it once, it's just the inner portion, which is opposing the globe that is being shown. But if you notice very carefully, I used, I went inside, deeper inside and rushed through the, uh, so it, I'm actually addressing the upper portion of the tarsal plate. Interesting. That yeah. interesting. Yeah. It works, uh, but I have to really do more cases to uh, make it a standard procedure. Because the one advantage I saw in that particular case was, in those few cases that I've done was, it's giving a good lid crease, which is not what we find in our uh, regular slings. So I think that it might be good if it works well, even for other congenital ptosis with just a single incision. And then yeah, I, I am not very sure because I am I have not been, um, you know, like uh, I, I tried it in adults. I've tried it in uh, two few cases of muscular dystrophy. And I've tried it in uh, my senior patients because it's easy to remove if you really don't want it to be uh, yeah. there. So yeah. that's the reason why I've tried in all those cases. It seemed to have worked well. And I think few other surgeons also have adopted it and said it's working reasonably well. But ma'am, how much of the uh, how much of the ptosis correction do we get? Like you yeah. said, you use it for mild ptosis. Yeah, so I've actually gotten about See, I can raise it about one or two millimeters above the pupillary. I can go up to that. It seems a little stiff in the beginning, but it works. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and we have a few other questions from the social media portal. Uh, the first one is how to manage a case of ptosis with the monoocular elevation deficiency. What all things to be kept in mind during surgical correction? So one, if there is elevation deficiency, that is the first thing to be addressed. So sh you should always get the squint surgeon or a pediatric ophthalmologist to first look at the case and see if you can get that corrected. In case they say it's not a surgically correctable situation, then what you can resort to is either you can just lift the lid adequate enough to expose the pupil and leave it at that, or you can you have to advocate the crutch glasses or the lid props. So it's important for us to be associating with these twin surgeons as well. And the next one is how to manage a case with poor bells. What all things to be kept in mind? Again, the same thing holds good. It's again to do with the elevation. If you you will have to check the bells. And if the bells is poor, see, I've tried doing a sling in uh, cases where the bells is poor, but what I've tried to do is just give them the correction adequate enough to visualize. That's all. 
please don't try to cosmetically match with the other lid or uh, sometimes we get over enthusiastic about giving a good correction but ending up with an exposure keratopathy which is not what we should advocate yeah um uh, mrutika any words from you for uh, safety enhanced cataract uh, like uh, doses correction um so i think i completely agree with what ma'am uh, said that we just aim for uh, clearing the visual axis one thing that we uh, should you know, remember in myogenic cases is avoid um, resections because these cases might require reversal in future if you're getting exposure uh, also even if these patients have um, say lps action above Eight, up to 8 or 9 mm that is still considered um, a poor lps action in this case we keep a lower threshold for uh, grading the uh, lps action because many of these cases are progressive um, and finally one thing that uh, can be done is um, we can do a lateral a temporary lateral tarsography uh just for about say a period of 2 to 3 weeks till the bells actually bells will not really improve in this case but at least till the time the patient is able to uh close the lid adequately and reduce the amount of lack of thalamus so for uh, cases where there, see it's very clear when your levator action is less than 4 you know that frontalis link is the choice the issue comes when your levator action is somewhere between 5 and 8 so in that case when it's closer to 5 6 i think what we need to do is overcorrect on the table just go just do an overcorrection of about a millimeter but when you have when you're closer towards good levator function you can just do it like 8 millimeters i think you need not overcorrect you can just do a uh, the right positioning but when you have an excellent levator action then you can actually undercorrect even undercorrect a little because it's going to open up very well so uh, this is only actually uh, out of you know you, you have to do your own cases to get this kind of an algorithm this is not something that you have to strictly follow you know that uh, and when you're doing a levator resection the tendency for most of us is to pull the levator up in your osseous we shouldn't actually do that that action should be definitely avoided because you're stretching it too much and there will be inaccuracy in your uh, amount of resections so please do not do that and i think a slight overcorrection in a poor levator action meaning if it's between 5 and 7 you please do an overcorrection is going to settle down very well and if there is a minimal overcorrection with the frontalis sling also you can do a gentle massage and keep uh, correcting it when there is a minimal overcorrection with the levator resection you can just do a hot fermentation a little pressure applied over the upper lid it can bring down the lid over a period of one or two weeks please do not rush and uh, try to correct it just give it a week or two and then you can Sure, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, Doctor Mohammad on YouTube has asked one question. What are your tips for beginners to expose the LPS properly, where everything looks alike intraoperatively? Very true. Very true. That's a very good question. Yeah. So please remember, all of us have had issues. There's no surgeon who's not had issues over this. It comes like I always say. For me, making chapatis is a big thing. so it only comes by practice so the same thing now the first thing you need to do is go layer by layer just know your anatomy well you know your first layer is the skin subcutaneous orbicularis you have the the uh, the minute you see something glistening that's the septum you have so septum is something which has a sheen okay it's like the cellophane sheen that you get that is once you open it up the fat prolapses in most of the cases if it's not a real prolapse prolapse you will at least see yellow globules here and there 
So that is an indication that you are above the aponeurosis. The fat is there and then the next layer is going to be aponeurosis. One small tip that I would give is, please don't work at the crease level. You can go a little lower. The crease is somewhere at 10 millimeters from the lid margin. So the crease is somewhere at, okay? So just go a little lower, you will see vertical fibers. At that point of time, you just stretch the lid. So you will see the vertical fibers quite well. And please use a microscope. Please use a microscope as you begin. Loop is good, but microscope is better. Okay, so use a microscope and start stretching to see the direction of the fibers. You know orbicularis is horizontal, levator of neurosis is vertical. When you see that the sheen again, the glossy sheen, vertical fibers, that's your aponeurosis. So you can always one glossy layer, one yellow layer, and then another glossy layer. And as you go closer towards the uh, tarsal plate, you will see that sheen very well. So that is, uh, that's the aponeurosis. And then you can disinsert and then you can, uh, you can start uh, dissecting it from behind from the, you can very well see the Muller, uh, Muller's muscle attached to the portion behind the aponeurosis. And you will see the upper tarsal edge having the pink Muller muscle. So it is going to take a while but please use the microscope. Practice a lot. <laughs> Another question from YouTube is by Dr. Praveen Sain Shahi. Is there any measurements to ensure proper height of lid crease in conjunctival sling? So as I told you, when you position the upper lid, so if the, the markings, I would say, uh, the, the, lid mark, the lid incisions, about two millimeters from the lid margin. That is from your lash line. Just about two millimeters above that. Don't go far above. Don't go too close to the lash line. Just about two millimeters above the lash line, corresponding to three and nine o'clock, which is roughly the size of the corneal diameter, which is about 10 millimeters, you all know. So the distance between the two incisions here would be 10, 10 millimeters. Now let's look at the incisions above the brow. So again, it has the central incision is what matters. Don't go far above or don't go too close to the brow. It's like you have to have control. So just about a centimeter above the brow would be fine, which is again 10 millimeters above the brow. Why am I going to about about 10 millimeters? That's where you your brow actually doesn't go beyond that. Hopefully, you have adequate brow so that you don't, uh, you know, you don't put an incision over that. So we can put the, uh, you know, that summit can be there. Then one, I would say it, the, uh, the ones on either side of the summit would also correspond somewhere uh, to the three and nine o'clock limbus because that's the kind of a pull you're going to give and that's adequate. And this I'm talking not by from the books. This I'm talking out of the experience that I've had in the past few years that I've done. So the height of the upper lid when you uh, finish the surgery should be exactly at the limbus because you would have some edema and you can expect a drop of about a millimeter postoperatively, which is what you want. But always remember, nothing like comparing it with the other eye. See, if you have a nice glaring look, then that's what you want in the other eye too. So just make sure that you do a good preoperative workup and see how much is the uh, upper lid, uh, uh, the lid height on the other side and correspondingly you can uh, position this lid as well. Um, next question is, is there any ideal time to operate a case of mild ptosis with Marcus Gunjong winking phenomenon? Yeah, so as I had earlier pointed out, first talk to the parents and see the child is not going to be 
telling you anything. The child may not even be bothered in the initial phases. With a mild uh, jaw winking, the child may not even notice. It will be somebody else noticing it. So you'll have to ask the parent what is their requirement. If it's just a flutter, you tell them it. See, even with a good dissection and a with very good excision of the levator, you can still have few fibers of the levator aponeurosis attached to the lid, uh, to the tarsal plate, and you could still have the flutter persisting. So that also has to be counseled to the parent. A mild flutter, you need not rush for it. And a mild flutter is not going to be very prominent. It's only the flutter which is more, which is going to keep the child and the rest of the crowd a little more apprehensive. Well, whenever the child is eating or drinking water in the classroom scenario, the other children might look at it and mock at the child. But generally with a mild flutter, we need not intervene unless the parents want it or if they grow into adults and they want it. Because when you grow up, that mild flutter may cause an issue later on. It might be like the child, the person is winking. So that might be an issue. So in that scenario, we can counsel the patient and tell them. Sure, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, another question related to the surgical time. Ideal age to do tarsofrontalis sling with silicone sling. Uh, is there any hard rule of like using a silicone sling post a certain age, like more than five years or six years? No, 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 no. There's no age level because silicone is a very compatible uh, material and it's been used widely in all cases. Now, assuming that you have a CNLDO, you're going to use it. You, you're only going to be using a silicon material if you have to intubate. So when you can use it inside, this is quite comfortable. And I have used it in very young children as well. When it's got, so the, the whole thing is around the visual function also. If you have a child with a very severe dosis, warranting after three months, see until three months, you're not going to have any you know, issue. After three months is when you, the child starts focusing and then that's when you start thinking about correcting to prevent an am amblyopia. So any time after that is, I, I do it. And no parent is going to, uh, see, we talk about facial data, we talk about silicone material. The minute we say there's an additional surgery in the thigh, it's like I'm running away. But when we say it's a very small material, one small incision, they're more than willing. So the whole purpose of not preventing amblyopia is achieved. So even if you have to adjust the lid height, you can always open up the small incision and adjust it. And somehow in my, uh, in my experience, what I've noticed it is that once the sling is passed, that seems to be a tendency for some kind of an inflammation which forms a band around the silicon material and even if you remove the silicon material sometimes the effect lasts so what is the secret for that suppose there is a granuloma and it warrants a removal of the sling material what you need to do is just remove it and don't press it because you try to squeeze out all the uh, you know, sterile pus out and um, in the process you break those bands. So what I tend to do is just gently remove that and let it be. So that sling effect lasts. Um, uh, Ma'am, the next question is, uh, should we do a staged procedure for a BPAS or like a single setting correction where a medial canthoplasty and ptosis and everything is done together? Okay, so this is again a debatable question. It's like, do we do uh, unilateral sling for unilateral cases or a, no? I, okay, uh, I have been doing single stage procedure for the past many years and you're seeing the results. Mm -hmm. So in my hands, it works, but I'm not going to be here. Uh, we can debate, but I don't think I would argue or dispute because every surgeon has a way of doing things. But it works in my hands, so I'm happy with a single stage procedure. But it's absolutely left to the choice of the surgeon.
And ma'am, if it's only for the cosmetic purpose that we are doing a BPAS and we have already done a TFS, probably a temporary slaying or like a toaster surgery earlier, what is the ideal age for that? Like if you have to counsel the parents, like for the cosmetic uh, correction of in BPAS. Yeah. So what happens is whenever you have a BPAS, patients are desperate. The parents are very desperate. They are uh, actually worried that there is something very grossly wrong. So you have to counsel the parents that as the child will sometimes, if you see, will lift the, you know, they'll use their uh, hands to lift and see, or they'll elevate their chin and see. As long as the child is seeing, I'm not worried. But when the child is not seeing and the child is complacent, not willing to open, I think it's as early as possible is what I would say. So there are very young kids where it's a slit and the child is hardly able to see. So wait for three months, child is healthy, fit for anesthesia. If, if it's a slit, I would take it very early. If it's reasonable, then we can wait and then you can take it up. So my answer, my straightforward answer is it all depends upon the amblyogenic effect the child is going to develop eventually. Mm. Ma'am, the next question is, uh, can you please describe the plane that we pass through when we are passing a sling, like the transfrontalis sling? What are the planes that we should confirm with? Yeah, that's a very important question. I, I'm sorry, I missed. This. So when you're making the incision on the forehead, please remember skin subcute, you have the frontalis here. So please don't cut through the frontalis. You just have to reach to the point of frontalis because it is the frontalis that we need to engage in order to uh, activate that, um, you know, the lid. So please don't make any slit on the frontalis. So when you're making an incision, it's possible for us to, you know, when you're using a monopolar, it's very likely that you can slash through the so initially to start with, please use a blade. There's no, there's no place for ego there. You just use a blade, visualize. Again, use a microscope. It's very, very helpful to visualize. Then you will see the frontalis. Use your retractors, very small retractors. You have these skin hooks, you can use that. You can visualize the frontalis, engage the frontalis. Okay. And then as you're going down, so you must... Remember that your lid is almost only two millimeters thick. So you have so many layers in your lid. So what I would be very uh, careful about is I have to pass the, uh, the uh, needle at a plane just below the skin and the orbicularis. Okay. And when you're coming to the, uh, you know, the uh, lid uh, uh, incisions, you're going to brush through the, you're not getting into the tarsal plate, you're just brushing because you need to scrape that tarsal plate because you need to create some inflammatory, uh, you, you have to create some inflammation. You're going to scratch that. So that will form a band around that area. Okay, so it doesn't slip. And then again, you have to make sure that it is only skin or beneath the skin orbicularis that you're passing the suchinity. I mean, the sling. I think that would like really help the beginner surgeon because all these things we really need to keep in mind when we are passing because how deep or superficial we are, I think that really... Uh, really matters, yes, yes. Uh, any other questions, Ruju, uh, Subhav, uh, Ritika? Anything from your side? Uh, Ma'am, when you were just explaining to us that um, you know, we don't break those fibrotic bands. Yeah. Suppose we have to pass a new sling. Suppose yeah. for some reason we have to pass a fresh sling. Do you still keep those bands or do you break them? It's again a very, very valid question. And we have come across situations like that. I actually feel that you need not break any band anytime because the needle is sharp enough and you can easily push it through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you don't have to break it at any point of time. Okay. And ma'am, if um, there is sling exposure at the ends, 
uh, what is what is the management that you method that you follow? Do you take kit out or do you try to reposition it? Yeah, so just the end as far as possible. See, once it's exposed, yeah, it's contaminated. It's contaminated. So what I tend to do is how much of it is exposed. You assess it because we are creating a tunnel there, mm. and then it is gone in. And there's something that's coming out. And if it is a small bit, you can just trim that. So always, what I another tip that I want everybody to remember is, this is a long, a large space. So feel free to make a long tunnel and leave a large bit so that all your trimming can happen in that. Only thing that we need to make sure is just bury it properly. But despite us burying it properly, we may have occasions where it can extrude out. And th that extruded portion can be easily trimmed off if we have an excess. That's what I would do. Okay. But if it's very bad, then again, I just give it by some time. As I told you, I want that inflammation to set in. I buy some time. I try to reposition it. I try that hard. And if it still keeps on getting inflamed, or infected, then I put an antibiotic, hold on for another month. By then, things would settle down and have that band formed. And then you can easily pull it out. Okay. But having said that, doesn't mean that all slings will remain that way. Mm -hmm. You may have failures. So I don't want people to go with an impression that it's an absolute 100% success. No, mm -hmm. I've had failures too. And what is your preferred suture material for temporary temporary sling? Mine is always silicone. I can't watch so much more loud because uh, it'll sound like I'm a, a silicone person, but no, I really enjoy doing it and I've been doing it for the past 20 years. Uh, temporary, like a suture material, if you have to use? Suture, ah, yeah. If you have to use a suture material, Ethibond works, used to work well, except that it causes a lot of granulomas. So that is a braided suture. So it, does, it has a tendency to cause a granuloma. So instead you can use nylon sutures. Nylon is easily available. But the only disadvantage with nylon is the slippage of the knot. So you have to be very cautious. You may have to keep knotting it and knotting it and knotting it. And don't just leave a knot like that. You just have to have a bow there so that it doesn't slip that very easily. All the points taken very well, ma'am. Thank you so much uh, again for that lecture, for sparing your time on a very busy day. Uh, you initially told us that it was a busy day for you. So thank you so much. Thank for so much. Enjoy. Thank you so much for all those questions and uh, happy to do it. I really enjoyed your lecture. And next we meet on September 1st, uh, which will be Management of Acquired Tosis by Dr. Santosh Nava. So see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Good night. Good night.